Um, yeah, it's, I've done a number of these presentations at national and international conferences, and the majority of them won't allow the presentations to be recorded because it stops people coming at subsequent events. Um, I try where I can to record them and then upload them to places like YouTube. So Lisa asked whether or not um, it could be recorded from the back. I don't have any problem with people taking photos or making notes and things like that. Um, I'm going to record the presentation on my laptop and then I'll uh, upload it to YouTube uh, and then post the link uh, for there. Um, it's about 45 minutes um, or as long as you want to ask questions at the end of it. Uh, if anything's not clear as we go through, please ask. Um, but there'll be uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, my background, I spent 25 years in the RAF as a uh, flight instructor, a supervisor, um, and then the last sort of 10 years in procurement, uh, looking at systems uh, and applying a systems engineering view to, to improving capabilities. Um, and at that time, I sort of read a number of papers on human factors and thought, okay, why can't we apply this sort of process to and rationale to sport diving? Um, and then two and a bit years ago, I signed up for a PhD, part-time PhD at Cranfield, looking at the role of human factors in scuba diving incidents, uh, trying to take stuff from aviation established environments and applying it to recreational diving recognizing that diving is a sport, a lot of personal risk involved, and there's very limited organization or supervisory oversight. Qualified diving-wise, advanced trimix on open circuit, and last December did my mod one on uh, CCR as well. Um, my job now, now that I've left uh, the Air Force, I'm a human factors instructor and a crew resource management instructor working in the oil and gas sector out in the Middle East, teaching what is described as common sense and life skills, uh, situational awareness, communication skills, decision making, leadership and teamwork. Um, and my big thing, I'm, I'm really passionate about safety and improving people's performance and trying desperately not to be judgmental and take a logical view and trying to take the emotion out of safety and diving and try and bring some, say, some logic to it. So, start off with the, the problems that we face in trying to solve a lot of the safety questions. Start off with a lack of data or access to this data. Um, a lot of it is held by headquarters in British Tobacco Club and it's not available for, for, for scrutiny, for um, data protection, confidentiality reasons, um, even some of the parametric data like depths, times, gases, aren't available to be released. The graphs here, um, we talk about, unfortunately, this weekend there's a fatality at Stoney, um, the start of the season, and there's an unusual um, blip in um, fatalities. So I went and pulled the data out, and actually we talk about two and a bit, two and a half is the average that goes across here for the um, fatalities between April and June. So actually, it's just that we notice it than we start at the start of the season, that there is a spike. But actually, in reality, there isn't. When we look at the numbers of fatalities, unfortunately, the projector doesn't show what's here as, in as much clarity. This is the number of fatalities uh, over the period uh, 2000 that goes back. Last summer, there were three months that had fat five fatalities in them. Again, that sort of clustering makes people go, ah, it's all unsafe. Oh, actually, it's average as about 14, 15 people die a year in diving over the last sort of 10 or 15 years. Which when you look at big numbers, it's about one in 100 to one in 200,000 divers, sorry, dives, ends up as a fatality. So you've got more chance of dying, driving to the dive site than you do actually on the dive itself. One of the big things that's uh, come out from aviation research, which is this graph on the right hand side as you look at it, this is general aviation, light aircraft flying in the States. You've got a sort of a, an equal split between a skill based error becoming an, a fatal or a non-fatal, a decision error 50-50-ish, perception error broadly 50-50, but a violation, you break the rules that are out there, 
you're about four times as my, as more, four times as likely to die in a violation-breaking situation than you are in a uh, in a non-fatal. Uh, so the rules trying to bring that across is don't break the rules. Okay, simple. Apart from the fact that in diving we have very few rules. Nobody's going to stop you. Club environment is slightly different, but ultimately you could go into a shop, buy a kit, go on a boat, go diving, and nobody can stop you. What you choose to do is your own responsibility. There are no hard and fast rules out there that you can break as such. So trying to say that was stupid, he broke the rules, there aren't any. You can't enforce them that are out there. So it's down to what is common sense and people's attitude to risk and safety. And I don't know why it's doing this. It will come back. So the metrics of safety. We talk about fatalities per dive, fatalities per diver per year. But actually, a dive could be a 100 meter dive, or it could be a 10 meter dive. It could be 20 minutes long, it could be five hours long. It's a really poor metric, but we don't have anything else at the moment. The numbers of incidents that we get reported is also a pretty poor metric. In 2009, there was something like 110 DCI incidents reported to the British Tobacco Club. I went in contact with the British Hyperbaric Association Chambers, their head, and said, OK, how many people did you treat for decompression illness in that year? And they came back with more than 350. So massive under-reporting. And I reckon it's anywhere between five and ten times the number of incidents that really happen versus what gets captured. And so when you end up with statements like this from the Coast Guard, the number of diving incidents has fallen to its lowest level in 21 years, according to the latest figures from the Coast Guard. There are 136 incidents in 2013, which included 10 fatalities. The weather wasn't particularly good in 2013 at weekends. Not so much diving, ergo not so much incidents or fatalities that occur. So being very careful with the statistics that are out there, yes, it's a good way of boosting and bolstering confidence that actually diving is a, is a relatively safe sport and, and it's you that takes the risk. But bear in mind that when they come up with statements like this, it needs to be taken with a bit of, bit of salt, a pinch of salt. We've always done it this way and nothing's gone wrong, so why should we change? And I'm sure that people have been out on boats, yeah, it's okay, it worked the last time, why should I change? And unfortunately, a double fatality last Easter or last March time, um, where a, sorry, June, where a piece of equipment, rebreather equipment, had a number of failures in it that had been carried. And unfortunately, on that particular dive, it cost the guy's life. Um, you know, but you get into that mindset that I managed to cope with the last time, it'll be okay this time, because nothing went wrong the last time, or I managed it. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of things to line up and make the chain or the network of, of factors, and then it goes horribly wrong. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to spot those. And in this presentation, I'll show you that it's not easy to spot things that are happening, especially if you're focusing your attention on something else. Trying to get hold of data is a nightmare. People don't want to talk about it because they're embarrassed. They know that they shouldn't have done what they've done. Um, trying to get hold of data from organizations they don't want to expose themselves um, to things that have gone wrong. Confidentiality. We don't have a good culture when it comes to learning from detailed incident reports. We all make mistakes. We are human. We make errors. We make mistakes. It's natural to do that. And I'll talk about the different types of, of errors that are out there and why it's very difficult to spot them individually. To drift is human. Humans are very good at finding shortcuts to get things done quickly. And when things don't go wrong, you make a decision. You go, ah, that worked the last time like this. Maybe I can try it the next time. And each time that happens, you set a new baseline. And you think, that worked, that worked. And then you realize that actually I'm somewhere over here. That's where I am now. That's what the rules or the best practice was. And I'm a long way away. 
That is human nature. That's how we have evolved. We don't know what we don't know. There's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, and this graph sort of highlights it. This was done, this is a study that looked at what people thought they'd done in their exams and what they actually did. And as you'd expect, there's a, a spread of those at the bottom of the class and those at the top of the class. And this is what people thought they scored in the exam. Those at the bottom of the class massively overestimated their abilities. But those at the top of the class were actually a little bit underconfident. And that's, where they, that's what they, um, they really scored, and that's what they thought they were going to score. So you're caught in a trap, really. If you're not very competent, you don't know how good you are, but you over, you're overconfident in that sense. So you don't know when things are going wrong, which is why you need to build that experience with colleagues, mentors, coaches, to recognize when things are different. So what is human error? It's not a simple thing to define, because normally we define it afterwards, the event. If you're in a, uh, an activity and you've got a number of options available in front of you, you don't know at that time which one's going to end up in a bad situation in the future. But when the thing has happened and you look back and you go, ah, I made that bad decision, that was an error, and I made that bad decision, that was an error, and that was an error. But at the time looking forward, it's very difficult to work out whether or not you're making a mistake. Because if you know you're going to do it, you don't normally do it. You know, people don't get up in the morning and say, today's a good day to die. I tell you what, let's go and do that. They don't choose. So it's very difficult to, to, um, to recognize when you're making errors looking forward. And whether or not something is an error is what the, the, um, the society or the group or the community think it is. A lot of activities people get on and do, that's just part and parcel of, of, of the tax. You need to have a standard or a requirement to start with. Because if you haven't broken a standard, you haven't made an error. How do you know that something is wrong if you don't have something to compare it to? And again, go back to the point right at the start. What are the standards or the rules that we're talking about in diving? Where we have such a vast view of what's right and wrong. You only need to look on the, the internet forums to see the emotion that comes out when people say, ah, this is what I did. Well, that's wrong because this is it. Well, that's your view. That doesn't necessarily mean that's right or wrong. It's just your perception of that. Errors. Um, we are people in complex social technical um, environments. We use equipment that's technical. We're part of a community. We are influenced by the culture and the, the norms of that community. So how you behave is how your peers behave, predominantly. So trying to work out what's right or wrong out inside there compared to the wider group is quite difficult at times. Errors stigmatizes or we find scapegoats. The work I'm doing out in the oil and gas industry, invariably something happens, right, he's to blame. Okay, why? And you try and understand what happened. Well, in one case where somebody was using a piece of equipment and he was trying to do two tasks at once, something went wrong and somebody got injured. The health and safety guys were like, it's his fault, he shouldn't have been doing that multitasking operation. Okay, were there any rules that said he couldn't do it? Nope. Okay, so he's not breaking any rules. Then they went, oh, there are now. Okay, fine. Then it's a case of, how many times have you been doing that? A lot. 20 or 30 times. Okay. Who saw him? All the supervisors that are around. Okay. So he's doing an activity that nobody's questioned what he's doing. Everybody's walked past and not said anything. Therefore, it's safe. He's now had an accident and it's unsafe. What changed? Nothing. Just your perception of what has happened. And it's the same thing that happens with diving incidents. Lots of stuff goes on on boats where people look at it and go, not sure about that. Okay, well, just let it go. It's not my problem, it's his. He should know what's going on. But actually, he may not know the, the, uh, what their kit is configured incorrectly in their perception. So it's very easy to say, well, he should have known better. He's stupid. He's a Darwin Award winner. Actually, it's not as simple as that when you start looking at these things. 
The point I said earlier on about drifting, that's how humans evolved. We break the rules to get the job done. That's how we got to where we are. It's understanding the rules or the best practice, what's behind there, why it's in place, and allow you to go beyond them. People wouldn't have got some of the dives done if they followed the rules. You know, you go back 20 or 30 years, let's push the boundaries, the pioneers that were out there certainly pushed the limits. They understood what they were doing, um, and some of them didn't make it back. But that is what we do. Sorry, yeah. That's right. Situational awareness is, um, is one of the, the key themes within the human factors and crew resource management training that, uh, that I deliver. And it's not simply a case of seeing what's in front of you. I'll show you miss stuff in a, in a demonstration in a minute. It's actually noticing what's there in front of you, thinking about it, and then anticipating into the future. The problem is our view of what is going to happen in the future is heavily biased by what we've experienced in the past. If things work really well and you quickly look at a scene and you go, yep, yeah, it looks like one of those previously, this is what's going to happen in the future. But you don't pay attention to a lot of detail that's in front of you. It's like driving a car. You don't study everything that's in front of you. You pick up cues and you fill, up, fill in the gaps. The problem is if you're task loaded, you forget or you miss stuff. And this clip will show this. If you've seen it before, don't say anything because I know there's going to be some stuff. Yeah, you've seen it. Um, there will be some stuff that you have missed. So if you watch this. This is a test of selectivity. Count how many times the players wear white to pass the basketball. So a simple task white players. Passing a basketball between each other, white player to white player. Count the passes, because that's what the task is. How many passes did you count? That's going to find the. Oops. The correct answer was how many? 15. 15, okay. And let's see if I can. Count how many times. Oh, I hate IT. Right, I'll let it run through and you'll, you'll see it the next time. Right, who spotted the gorilla? Okay, who's seen the clip before? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Okay, that, that, that works for me. What was written on the wall? Okay. Who saw, hands up if you saw something written on the wall between the, um, the lifts. Okay. How many plant pots are in this scene? Lisa? None. Mark? Two? Three? None? Okay. Anything else that was in the scene? So there's a gorilla, the S. When I normally give this presentation, I, I, I give it to a group that's got a hierarchy in it. And I pick the senior guy, and I say, how many plant pots are in the scene? Two or three. And I've already spoken to him beforehand, and he says two. And everybody else follows what's going on. If you've got a disparate group like this, where there's no hierarchy, it's more independent thought. There are lots of things going on around you that, yes, you were looking for the gorilla when it came in, but there are other things in the scene. When you go diving, there are other cues that are out there that you need to monitor. But if there's something like shooting film or, or taking pictures um, or seeing squidgy stuff, if that's what really gets you going, that's what will grab your attention. And you won't necessarily pay attention to what else is going on around you. The current may have picked up. You may have a leak in, in, uh, in your gas. You may not be monitoring your, your kit as you should do. So it's very easy to get absorbed into the situation. Errors are classified into three main types, or four, I suppose you could say. Um, lapses is where you think you've done something. You're convinced that you've done something, but actually you've forgotten. So in the future, somebody goes to you, oh, have you done this? Yeah. But in your mind, you think you've done it. So you're not going to pick up that sort of error. A mistake is where you come up with a... Um, 
an excellent plan in your own mind and you execute it perfectly, but it was the wrong plan. And again, if somebody says to you, did you do the right thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about this? Ooh, didn't realize that. So in both cases, in lapses and mistakes, you're convinced that you've done the right thing. And you're not going to spot it yourself until you come up to something, a barrier that says you should have done something. Violations are where you break the rules. Situational violations where it's become the normal. That you, you break a rule to get the job done. Or it's just become your behavior. So surfacing with, say, less than 50 bar on the, uh, or ending the, on the surface with less than 50 bar. Okay, that's a sort of a, an accepted norm. But there are lots of people who end up on the surface with a lot less gas than that. And I'll show you some of the figures later. There are exceptional violations where people break the rules to, say, rescue somebody. And they've got it, you know, they, they've taken the risk, they understand it, and they've broken the rules. And that isn't something that's done normally. So if you're within a community that regularly breaks a rule, that's become the normal. And group behavior, as I'll show in a minute, it's very difficult to question that sort of thing. I had a, a, um, a discussion with somebody who uh, was a member of an overseas British Tobacco Club club and their diving officer is taken just recently um, somebody who's just qualified mod one down to 50 meters on air he doesn't believe that all of this advanced training is worth anything um, and regularly takes people beyond safe diving practices that is the norm of his club and the difficulty is trying to get that changed back to this uh, violations there are lots of biases that we're exposed to when it comes to diving incidents. Hindsight bias is that the fact that once something has happened, an adverse event has happened, we can join the dots after the event and say, ah, oh, well, he should have spotted this and he should have spotted that. You already know what the outcome is, so it's easy to work back from there to say, right, I'm going to look for cues and clues that lead to that. There's something called um, you will find what you seek when it comes to um, accident investigation. If you know what the outcome is, you'll start looking for cues and clues to meet that, rather than go there with a blank mind and, and try and ignore what the, court, what the final outcome is. Confirmation bias is where I, you preload somebody with information. The same thing for the plant pots. Normally it would be a case of, you know, somebody would lead on with that. They would expect the answer that I've told them. This next um, slide shows an interesting way that people think about it. I'm going to show you an excerpt from a, a map, a black and white map from World War II. The white areas are land and the dark areas are water. And I want you to look at this and, and have a think, and I'll give you 30 seconds, have a think of where you think this might have may, may occurred or where it's come from in the world. So the white areas are land dark areas of the sea. If you see where it is, don't shout out. Yeah, it's alright, yeah, I know. <laughs> Any ideas where this might be? America? Denmark? Any other suggestions? No. How's about the front of a cow? There's an ear. There's an eye. There's a nose. There's a head. I asked you to go looking for something. I'm in a position of trust at the front of this room. You believe what I'm telling you. So when your colleagues are there doing something for you and it's life critical like, Analyzing your gas, mixing stuff, anything that's life critical, don't trust them because they may have got the answer wrong and they will say, Yes, I've me I measured your gas and it's this amount, you know, it's 32% point whatever. They have already preloaded your decision making. You can look at something and go, Yes, that matches what I've already heard. So clear your mind when somebody tells you some important information. And conversely, if you're going to try and check understanding, if you're in a, a supervisory position, don't give them the answer in the question. 
because it's very easy to say yes. So if I'd say the gas you analysed, it was 32.3%, wasn't it? Yeah. Tell me what percentage was that you analysed. And the same thing, you know, depth, time, decompression, what's your dive plan. Get people to explain it to you rather than tell them what the answers are to start with. Recall bias is where really um, obvious things stick in your head. Fatalities. When there was a big, um, well, over that six-week period last year when there were, I think, there were eight fatalities, people were just, ah, it's really dangerous. It's, you know, it's a terrible time. And it's just a small cluster, unfortunately, of fatalities in a short period of time. But because it sticks in your head, that's it. Rebreathers. Terribly dangerous. You know, they're going to be... the a complete nightmare to go diving. And yet, the data isn't there, but it's not immediately clear what the real risk is. The guys who go diving rebreathers are normally on deeper dives. So their exposures are greater. They're using different gases. Unless you know what the metric is that you're trying to measure, it's very difficult to say what the risk is. If it's a simple metric like fatalities per diver, yes, it probably is a, a greater risk. But you've got to balance it against everything else. Sorry? <laughs> per year. <laughs> Some people might say you might not be able to. <laughs> Social desirability. Wanting to be part of the group. So I'm going to ask her, oh yeah, okay. How many people, when they go to public toilets, wash their hands properly? There's a lot of people going... Okay, 70% of people don't wash their hands properly when they go to the toilet. People try to conform to the norm. They don't want to stand out. And when you're in a dive boat or something's not quite lined up and you see something, you go, hmm, nobody else has mentioned that. Do I want to break ranks and question what's going on? And I'll show you how popular, how powerful group behaviours are and what you can do to, to, uh, to stop that in your own environment. You've got to have a lot of courage to start with. So there's two clips coming up. You won't have seen the first one, Mark. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks were entering, the man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat There are three clips like this. I'll just show you how powerful it is. Now reflect of when you're in a dive boat or you're in a diving situation and behaviours happen. Just a little bit more. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera stand. Three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups. Now, I know Mark's been involved in a, a rescue, and there were a lot of people standing around going, think of it the other way around, that actually nothing gets done until somebody initiates a change. 
The, the next clip comes from a, uh, a documentary called The Human Zoo, and this particular episode was called Following the Herd. This clip um, shows a subject who'd gone for a job interview. She was sitting in a conference room, and she was one of, I think it's 18 people in the room. The other 17 people were told, do not react. Something's going to happen, but just sit there, very calm, and completely ignore what is going on around you. What's going to happen is there's a fire going to start. The smoke is going to come into the room, and then the alarm goes off. You'll see what happens. And the times are quite shocking, really. What will happen to her script when we make a slightly unusual situation and then looking for some sort of reaction from someone else, even just the slightest little thing, that they recognise that there is something, you know, going on here. For me to kind of react on that and then do something about it, I kind of needed prodding. She's waiting for someone else to react. Why isn't anyone else reacting? She feels uncomfortable. She doesn't want to embarrass herself. And everybody goes, ah, I wouldn't behave like that. There's another clip. Yeah? There's a whole series of experiments. Yeah, and there was one I was going to say. There's one where they'd, um, they'd laid a, um, somebody out casualty on some steps in front of a busy walkway in a building. And um, they just sort of, you know, gently got down so it didn't look odd. And then they just sort of, uh, and just lay out there. And people were walking past until somebody broke ranks who was part of the, the team. And then everybody else went in to help. But it takes one person to break that mold. And she was looking around, and I've seen it in my, my job where I'm um, teaching out the rigs, where the guys are looking at each other to see whether or not what they're doing is wrong. And because they're all looking around, nobody's saying anything, okay, fine, we'll carry on doing it. And it's the same thing. You know, human behavior is, is a funny thing. Um, it just takes somebody to stand up and say, stop. And that takes a massive amount of courage to do that. And it's great when people do, because then everybody else piles in. But until that happens, everybody just walks past, unfortunately. So when you're in that situation, have a look round. Um, you may be the only one that says, what are we doing? DCI, suspected DCI after a dive. That's right, the guy's just gone down to the, to the, the, the front of the boat or whatever, and, and he's just going to have a snooze. Okay, that's fine. Just think about those sorts of things. Because when you read the incident report afterwards, and people go, why didn't anybody do anything? Because group behavior is incredibly powerful. The safety paradox is a problem for researchers and, and safety people, is that as you make things safer, the evidence that you need to collect to show that things are going wrong still gets less and less. And the evidence to show that any interventions you're putting in place gets harder and harder to find as well. Because it might be that actually improvements are just down to noise and not part of a specific program itself. So when numbers are very small, it's very hard to prove whether or not something is having an effect or not. And, you know, when we talk about fatalities, or oh, this year is a good year for fatalities, i.e. there weren't that many. Okay, was it down to just random distribution noise that's in there, or was it because of certain things, and we can't collect that specific data. This is a, a survey that I did last year, the results, and I asked 12, 12, 
uh, questions, or there were 12 adverse events that I was looking for people to respond. And if the answer was yes, I'd ask them to go on and, uh, and fill in the rest of the questionnaire, which, which took a while to, to do. But the scary thing for me is these top two here. This was a self-selecting group anyway, but 26% of people were on the surface with less than 50 bar or their minimums, whatever their agency minimums were. 6% of people had physically run out of gas on a dive. And to me, that is totally unacceptable. You know, why are people running out of gas? Because their um, situational awareness is poor, they've got a poor plan, they're not following it, a whole bunch of things, all of which are avoidable. Unplanned separation, 23%. That, to me, again, is a totally avoidable situation. People go, oh, well, you know, the visibility in the UK is rubbish. So what? You just swim closer or get a brighter torch. You know, it's just there is no reason why you should have an unplanned separation. Now, when it comes to um, planned, and, and I made a specific uh, comment in a question, planned solo diving or planned separations, that's a separate bit. You'd already got that part of your plan. But unplanned separations. And then major equipment problem was down to um, the equipment itself, sorry, the use of that, rather than the equipment breaking. Yeah, just very quick on that. Yeah, sure. It's probably just perception, but except on, on the terms that um, tip the gun. Diving equipment itself is so well designed and so robust, I'm really surprised to see a figure that high. Or is uh, that's assumed that people service it and use it properly and... And the thing is that it takes a number of factors to come together to make equipment problems yeah. get picked up. Um, so, and people need to recognise, I mean, this was, you know, a survey that was done, filled in online, so it's difficult to understand the context. There were only a, number, a small number of sentences that were, were allowed to, to fill in the narrative. But, um, yeah, again, two different views on, on, on the same issue. That somebody who's used to servicing kit, uh, and somebody I'm guessing, used to, you know, you look after your own kit a lot. Uh, look, yeah. So... You know, people's perception of what the, the issue is. Um, sorry? That was 473 people. Um, and I, I, it's one of the frustrations I had. None of the major training agencies in the UK supported the research program, the promotion through so. There were 700 and something people completed uh, the survey and didn't have a. Um, uh, so there were 775 completions and 473 people had something. So what's that, about two-thirds had had something, or just between a half and two-thirds had had something out of that lot. Is that robust statistically? I doubt it. With the numbers, by the time you break it down, and the problem was that, and this is the frustration I had, that none of the agencies supported it. When I look at the DDRC survey that they did last year, it was something like 3,500 responses. Um, over, I think, a two-month period, uh, and I got 1,200 people started, 700-odd people finished, and that was over a six-week period. And most of that was because, and, and I plotted where the responses came, where I'd make a, a, a social media sort of broadcast, and then I'd get a peak, and then went drop. And it was directly linked to when I was making posts, unfortunately. These are the factors. There are about 100 factors that I, were ask, I was asking people to relate to, um, and shouldn't come as any surprise, these are the ones at the top. Complacency is a mismatch between your view, your model of the world, and what's actually going on around there. It's used as a term that goes, I was complacent, but don't necessarily understand why they were complacent. Overconfidence, that Dunning-Kruger effect, people overestimating their own capabilities, in the environment they're in. Judgment due to lack of experience again. Sort of areas. Anybody who's been involved in sort of diving safety, it won't come as a surprise. And one of the things that a colleague had said to me, the hardest things to prove are the obvious and a negative. Um, because
because everybody goes, oh, it's obvious. Okay, where's the data? Oh, I don't have any. Okay. I've yet to go and do a lot of the analysis on the data to find out where it's, uh, where it's sitting. These are some of the quotes that came back. And I don't know if, if you can read them at the back. Can you read them at the back? Are they? Okay, cool. I'll let you read them. But you're looking at 1,000 dives. He's a, uh, an instructor trainer, course director. I know he's running low of gas. I need to complete the dive. So off I went. Okay, so what happened if um, he had a problem, you know, your student had a problem and he needed to share off you? Inclusion, unplanned separation is a mistake. Well, being together, buddy diving, team diving, is one of the ways that you can control the risks that are out there. If you get separated, there is a reduction in the controls that are there. Somebody gave an analogy of, I'm parachuting. Or in fact, there's a bailout one that's later on. I'm parachuting, I've got a reserve parachute. If I dump my main, I'm using my own reserve, surely that's a compromise in safety. That's the same thing as dumping, you know, using, losing your buddy, losing your, your, your main rebreather, and then going on a bailout. So it's people's perception of the risks that are out there. This one, yeah, okay, managing the risk. Being less, you know, five to seven meters when reaching 50 bar. Okay, fine. Not, you know, the quiz or the, the, the survey had to cover all eventualities. And there were a number of people who said, well, actually, yes, when I get down, if I'm doing a reef dive, I swim around until I'm, um, you know, six meters, 50 bar, and then I'll go up. So I'm on the surface with less than that. Instant result, deciding to do an unplanned extended safety stop at five meters, but not monitoring other divers' gas supply. Why don't you use his pony if I was running low? Well, to me, if you're doing an extra safety stop of five meters and you're at 50 bar, you probably cut your, um, your dive planning down to pretty low anyway. Again, using a good plan. Decision to continue despite running low on air was taken by both of us. Only I was going to be low due to lengthy penetration. Both aware of it decided to continue. Yeah, I know I'm breaking the rules, but off we go. Hoping that something doesn't go wrong as a consequence. Can we just ask a question about mm -hmm. the instructed efficient rules then? I generally don't know the answer to this. If, you're, if you dive with a major agency like the SAC or Paddy, and you're a student who's brave enough or competent enough or both to recognise that the instructor, that the instructor has been deficient in the training, if you report that to the BSAC or Paddy, is the instructor disciplined and effectively uh, busted back down? No. There has to be a number. So there's a couple of bits. One is <coughs> it will go through, it will stay, start with stays inside the club if you want to. You can go to the training officer, the dive officer, or the committee. Where, when there's been a situation where it's the, the diving officer, um, I've gone to headquarters to find out what they do, is you should go to the committee and say, look, I've got a problem with the diving officer because it's not being managed properly. But there are a number of steps that have to be gone through, and there needs to be some fairly major um, breaking of rules for it to, to, to have an effect. And then there will be counsel, coached, brought back. And if it's still not working, off you go. And the same thing goes with Paddy as well, that they have to have a number of severe you know, situations to, to occur, reported. They'll be investigated, see what both sides of the story are. Uh, and if it's still... They'll, they'll go through training, counselling again, development, and if it's still a problem, that's when they get, uh, they get removed. But it takes a number of iterations um, before, unless there is a major breach that you can go, look, that was just negligent, what are you doing? Um, but it's the, the, the agencies don't have, in my opinion, a robust quality control or quality assurance process well, in so place. So do they have to do physically have a survey Students. Yes, but your student doesn't know what he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, he doesn't know what he doesn't know, but if I'm quite sure if he was scared witless, mm -hmm. <laughs> hopefully there's yeah. well, that's, that's going. Most of it is to do with whether or not they said the right things about the next following course, but at least maybe they do follow up. Yeah. Where in B there's no, we, we hope that within the club we sort of check ourselves. Like so. and, I, and I find it. Um, until recently, just finding out how BSAC runs, where you've got headquarters and then you've got a collection of groups, 
who are their own entities. The club, in effect, is, is a member of a bigger club. And, and how the, the local branch runs is pretty much up to the diving officer and the, and the community itself. And as long as they're following safe diving practices, off you go. Um, but not necessarily. In, I know of a case not that long ago where a diving officer for a club took a sports diver down to 50 metres. He had a massive panic attack, uh, spat his reg. He ended up in hospital that night. That diver officer is still a diver for that club because no one wants the job. That's good to see, you know, it's it, because that group behaviour, if you end up with the, the, the sort of the hierarchy behaving badly and nobody can question, either people move on and they just leave it, or they boot somebody out, and, and, and they go to another club. So it's, it's difficult uh, to manage in that sense. But it's down to personal responsibility. Uh, and nobody's forcing you to go diving, ultimately. So please, that's initial answer was to uh, change club. Hide the problem. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Next one. Oh, sorry, go on. Getting back to the 50 bar thing, does anybody ever tell people that 50 bar on your contents cage doesn't actually mean you've got 50 bar left. It's the point at which the manufacturer no longer guarantees the accuracy of the gauge. So you may have 50 bar, you may have 30 bar. If I tell people that, look at me, you spun the main to them. But they are, uh, that's actually what it means. Because everyone now actually tells people why you technically have this 50 bar rule. Because people don't understand why we have it, people think, oh, it's fine, so I'll just put it like say, push that a little bit more, I'll push that a little bit more. I um, probably not because it's one of those little things that isn't part of the core yeah, material yeah. that's passed on. I regularly run out of gas on my stage bottles because I use bottom stages when I go and do deep trimix dives. And I know with about 10 or 15 breaths to go that it's getting to the stage. It's like, oh, okay, oh yeah, right. I now know that that's the case. You know, I find it odd, although people get task loaded that, and then they, they lose track of what's going on and their breathing rate goes up and, and the gauge goes down massively, that people run out of gas without realising they're going to run out of gas. And also, technically, you have to have a minimum of 10 bar in your sentence to make a regular to work. Well, yeah. So the last 10 bar you can't get to, and that's the point. So you've only got 40 bars to play within your 50 yeah. bar reserve. Or, or people don't know yeah. how to gas plan properly, um, which is another one as well. Uh, we'll, we'll plan thirds. Really? But, well, that's another whole different ball game. Um, cardiac problems always ends up as um, something in the, the annual report, um, especially with the ageing diving population that's out there. 60%, this is from um, Dan's research, of cardiac-related deaths, 60% complained of chest pain, uh, dyspnea, or feeling unwell before or during the dive. Okay, so you end up with situations like this one, well, there's two here. Dive around to the water with a buddy. Signing a declaration is fit to dive. Dive surface after a 25 to 30 meter dive, short of breath, blood in their froth and spittle. He'd had a heart surgery four to six weeks before and was still on strong anticoagulants. Skipper didn't know about it and went mental when he found out with the organiser. Now in this case here, the guide surfaced, it needs to be on auction, oh it's not diving related. Okay, well. Um, so they get him on the boat and um, he starts to go blue, so the skipper calls the coast guard, he gets evacuated. The, uh, the rest of the divers are all upset and as they're driving back in, you know, motoring back into port, um, Skipper's going to console one of the, the, the ladies on board. Oh, I knew. We told him he shouldn't have done this because we knew this would happen. What? And then it came out that he'd had heart surgery um, and then confronted the trip organiser. It's like, what? So, you know, you don't know what you don't know. People think, yeah, it's okay. With the top one, was that only found out at the coronary by chance? It was afterwards, yeah. yeah. The, the diver in question, you. Yeah. I mean, they 
Sign, sign his own declaration, as he cast himself as fixed die. Yes. Right. So. What's the GTA? Uh, spray for something heart attacks. Well, it's, it's quite an obvious spray that nobody's noticed. It's the undertaking. Confirmation bias? No, we didn't. Oh, we don't. What's it called? It's, it's, a, it's a spray that you, um, see, you inhale it. It's, it's a preventative action spray. So it's, it's a spray. So it's a case of, you know, it's your risk. Whatever you want to do, you know, find, you sign your own declarations. It's your risk. But bear in mind that if something goes wrong, somebody's going to have to fish you out of the drink. And your family and your friends are going to be left behind. There is nothing worth dying for underwater. Although, having spoke to somebody who rescued their wife that was probably the decision that he had to make, and he made the decision, she's going to die here if I don't do anything. If I take her to the surface, she may live, and I might die as well. That's probably the only time that you'll make a decision that says, I'm going to go for this. But any other time, call the dive. And it's really easy to say in a calm environment like this, where there's no peer pressure, and if you ask anybody, yeah, I'd throw the dive. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get in. And then actually you go out in a boat environment and it's not as simple as that. You've just spent, especially if it's a hard boat, and you're going to go you know, 15 miles offshore. It's costing you 50 quid for the boat. The gas is costing you whatever. The bed and breakfast costs you this. The fuel to get to it. You've got two or 300 quid invested in this dive already. Uh, yeah, I think I can get on with that one. That'll be fine. Now just play the future game. What would happen? How would I explain this if it all goes horribly wrong? Can I justify myself in the future looking back at this? And if the answer is, actually, that's pretty stupid, probably not a good idea to get in the water if that happens. False statements change behaviours. This clip here, look at the guy's expression when, uh, when the, the adverse event happens. People who've been um, involved in a, an adverse event where somebody's got badly injured or they've been killed, it certainly shapes their mind and how they behave and how they check their own kit. And I know Mark's been involved at least two now uh, that I know of. Um, maybe you're just a Jonah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Every time Graham might dive somewhere that year, something went wrong. Every time it was the same trip. And when you look at these sorts of things, and I know a number of people who've given up diving or they've massively changed their diving when something has gone wrong and they go, actually, is it worth it to take the risks that are out there? And unfortunately, uh, fortunately, this, this sort of safety paradox, people don't get exposed to what the real risks are because they happen so rarely. And you play the, oh, it won't happen to me, that's somebody else's problem. I'm, I'm a safe diver. And then you go, actually, after the event, well, I, I wish I'd done something differently. Do you find that people who, in their day job, work in high-risk environments tend to be safer divers? <sighs> I don't know. I don't have enough. The, the, the people that I dive with, because I, I dive in um, within sort of GUE style, the guys that I dive with are normally in um, jobs where, actually, it's nothing to do with the job. It's their attitude themselves. Um, to get that job, they probably have that attitude, not that they have that job, and therefore that's what... So it's, it's probably that way around, not the other. Um, but I also know people who dive, or who are in high-risk jobs, who you just wouldn't want to go anywhere near. Um, it, it's, it's attitudinal rather than professional. Um, which actually leads nicely onto culture and what people perceive to be safe. Culture is how we do things around here, the values that are within the community. And actually, when you've got such a disparate community, different clubs, different training organizations, and people who dive on their own, 
it's very difficult to have a this is how we do stuff around here in terms of diving. Everybody's got their own different view. Everybody's got the view of what risk is. If you think safety is um, not having injury or risk, and risk is personal as to what you think is acceptable because nobody's defining what is an acceptable value, it's very difficult to say what is safe. Somebody who goes off and does a 100-meter trimix dive on, on a rebreather with you know, four stages um, compared to asking somebody who's an open water diver, is that a safe dive? <laughs> no. And yet they've trained, they've got the attitude, they've got the skills, what they should do to conduct that safely. They don't take, some of them take unnecessary risks, but most of them are known before they get in the water. A just culture is where people recognize that we're all human and we all make mistakes and we should learn from those mistakes in an educational manner, not a disciplinary, and I'm, I mean that socially as well, of basically throwing stones at people for making mistakes and going, that was stupid, what did you do that for? That was really obvious. You know, as I said earlier, things are never obvious when they're right in front of you. Um, you miss those things. So trying to get that culture where people talk about the mistakes they've made without having rocks thrown at them. Part of that is also a problem from the, if you're going to lead by example, getting instructors, known people to talk about the mistakes they've made. But then we go back to the litigious society, if somebody admits that they've talked about the mistakes they've made, and then something happens in the future, the lawyers go, ah, look, he made mistakes all the time. No, he was just honest about the mistakes he made, unlike the majority of people. A reporting culture, sorry, you were about to, I thought you were about to say something. No. Um, a reporting culture, it's not normal to talk about or report the incidents we have. If you look at the amount of stuff that actually goes on and the stuff that gets reported and the detail of which it's reported, to understand why an incident happened isn't the case of he had an uncontrolled boy in ascent. Great. So that's what happened. Got to understand why. What was the decision making process? Were they distracted? Were they just not interested? Were they not monitoring something? That's the lessons that we need to get out of incident reports. The, the, the story before the incident, not what happened itself. He drowned because he didn't ditch his weight belts. Great, we can't learn about that, you know. Being honest regarding the risks that are out there, yes, it's a relatively safe activity as long as you've got the right attitude that goes with it. But if you don't have technical life support equipment, you will drown. It's as simple as that. If it's not working properly, your point, if it's not, you know, the equipment, if it's not working properly, it's not going to end well. And I think th there is this balance to be played with getting people interested in the sport and getting them, keeping them in, and at the same time exposing them to the real risks that are there. If they don't follow the protocols, if they don't service their kit, if they don't understand how their, their um, SPG works, that says 50 bar, great, I've got this amount of gas, well, actually, it may be a lot less than that. Training and standards, We're talking about um, what happens with instructors and things. I take this, you know, I didn't take this photo, I got sent it through, and everybody goes, ah, we've seen that all the time. We shouldn't. I don't blame these guys here. I blame their instructors for not teaching them properly. That, to me, is unacceptable. And people go, oh, great, first down the shot, I'm going to see the rep, nobody else will. Brilliant, thanks very much, you selfish kid. I wouldn't be happy with that. And I'm, you know, when, if, if I'm kicking up stuff, I'm mortified. I want to know why. But these guys are oblivious to it. Training and standards. The agency's training standards, what should be delivered, is in, in the main pretty good. The difficulty is ensuring that what's written is actually delivered as it should be consistently. And a lot of it is down to personalities. And some instructors teach well beyond what they should do, which is great to make quality divers, as long as the guys aren't task-loaded. There are people who teach the, the absolute minimum to get away, sign the card, and off you go. And they don't, those students don't know what they don't know. And so when the QA form comes in, did you have any problems? Da -da -da -da, off you go. Yeah, the minimum should be enough. You know, you say if it's taught work, properly. It be, the, the minimum, that's the course, that's the skills. If you could 
That's the assumption that the instructor is teaching. So define mastery of the skills. Um, my view of what mastery should be is subjective. And communication is talking about stuff before you get in the water. Briefing the plan so that everybody understands what it is. Checking each other properly. Doing proper buddy checks. And not just looking up and down and going, yeah, you've got to regulate your own mouth, that's fine. There's a number, of, unfortunately, a number of incidents where people have got in with a pony regulator in the mouth, breathe the pony empty, and I know at least three fatalities as a consequence of that. Because they spat it out, gone to get the pony, and funny old thing, the pony's empty. So, having, in fact, I'll talk about checks in a minute, and learning to say no, <clears throat> that, you know, we should be able to thumb a dive at any time for any reason, and yet I get reports in where people have gone, I tried to thumb it, but the dive leader, whoever it was, decided we're going to carry on. Okay, you have a rather frank discussion when you get back on the boat, but then the person's left in this awkward situation. Do I thumb the dive, ascend on my own, and leave them to be on the bottom on their own, or do I stay with them uncomfortable and hope nothing else goes wrong? So it should be a thumb, we're all going up, not the, are you sure? Why? What are we going for? No, let's go now. And if you don't feel good, don't get in the water. And if you're worried about, you know, somebody missing their dive and, and the money that's involved, it's much better to be on the boat a little bit poorer than on the bottom somewhere, very rich but dead. Checklists. Rebreather divers in here? Or oh, markers. Use a checklist. Some some nods, some not so nods. Having a checklist doesn't mean that you're invincible. Having a checklist and not following it properly, you may as well not have a checklist, and potentially it's worse because you've got a false confidence that's there. You need to have a checklist that you follow religiously. And if you get interrupted, you go back to the start. If you're halfway through a check, halfway through a checklist and you get interrupted, and then you try and pick it up where you thought it was, you'll miss it out. And there are a number of incidents where people have missed assembling their equipment properly. Checklists also, things like, you know, a verbal buddy check before you get in the water. Do it properly. Check that stuff is where it's supposed to be. That, um, uh, the Invisible Gorilla clip earlier on. Just because somebody is sitting in front of you doesn't mean that actually you're looking at what's in front of you. You're not noticing it. Stuff that might be connected or not, as the case may be. This is um, the one that GUE have put together for um, their rebreathers. And what you can't see, because it doesn't show at all, On the right down here is a little signature grid. The same way you do gas analysis, date it, sign it, what's in the gas. That goes on the side of the dill cylinder so that buddies can see actually, yes, you've got that. Yes, it's linked to the attitude as well. Because yes, you could just go down there. But actually, having the right frame of mind. Because they could be relying on your equipment as well. Where I sort of try and help out and getting the message out there is I launched um, an online reporting system two and a bit years ago, three years now, at, uh, at Lids, which is a database that runs online all the time and can be queried by anybody. Um, anybody can submit reports. It's totally agency agnostic. And I know that the, the, the British Tobacco Club Incident Reporting System is, independent, well, is open to all agencies. But it's still got a, a tag that says the British Tobacco Club Incident Report. Um, you can search the database for keywords or tags um, and, and it will come up with that. And as, as data is added, the database is available. So it's not like an annual report that's published once a year. I know headquarters hold the live database, but if there's any information like from coroner's inquests that gets issued after the event, that never actually gets added to a public database within the British Tobacco Club. That's why I put DISMS together. So last year, there were only 33 instances reported into DISMS. There are lots more out there. And one of the reasons is, you know, just knowing about it, which is why doing talks like this. The stuff that's available from DISMS can go into Jim's and uh, Brian's uh, report. 
risk of that. So, that wraps up my presentation. I'm more than happy to take any questions.